Awesome. Hey, welcome. Glad to have you uh, in the house of God uh, with us on this Sunday morning. We want to go ahead and say happy Father's Day to all the fathers of the men in the house. So appreciate you and your contribution to God's great kingdom advancement effort here in the Northwest. For all of our fathers or men ages 18 uh, and over on your way out, uh, this morning we got this brand new Pursuit keychain, and so if you identify as a man, just go ahead and grab one of those on your way out. <laughs> We'd be glad to bless you with that uh, this morning. Oh, y'all aren't ready. You haven't seen nothing yet. I'm just warming up today. <laughs> I got my lizard boots on. I'm going to kick a devil. <clears throat> kick a devil. Anyways, listen, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is our last Pursuit night for uh, this summer quarter. And I'm having one of my friends, Jay Koopman, joining us all the way from Southern California. Jay has been traveling with another friend of ours, Sean Foyt, across the nation. They have seen literally tens of thousands of people born again in places like Portland and Chicago. And he called me up and he said, man, the Lord put pursuit on my heart. I've been praying for you guys. I don't know why, but I've got a prophetic word and I need to release it over your church. And so he's going to come tomorrow night, 6 p.m., and uh, him and I are going to share a little bit on a prophetic picture of what God is doing in the church in this season. So you're invited out to that. And then this Friday, our first ever worship night in Seattle, Friday night at Golden Gardens Beach. Uh, really, the Lord spoke to Lydie and I over the last number of months and just encouraged us that prior to officially planting our every Sunday experience starting in September, we needed to soak the region in worship. And so we're calling all the radical worshipers to join us this Friday night, 6 p.m. at Golden Gardens. We rented out the bathhouse down there. We're going to pack the beach. I promise you there's going to be fights, conflict, protesters, all, all sorts of things. But that's why I wake up in the morning. I enjoy that stuff. And so we're going to go into the belly of the beast and we're going to worship until we have breakthrough. So anyways... Why don't you go ahead and join us for that. Hey, this morning I'm going to share with you out of Genesis 39, Genesis 39. I want to encourage you before I begin today that you can go ahead and just make a decision. Number one, to fasten your seatbelt because it's going to be a wild ride. But number two, just make a decision not to be offended. And I feel like if we can give people that proper context, it opens up their heart to receive revelation from the Lord. The Bible says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides bone and marrow. It cuts at the flesh of the heart. Not for the purpose of destruction, but for the purpose of healing. Some people love a church as long as the pastor isn't preaching on their sin. They want you to spend all your time being angry at people who sin differently than them. But all I know is that the Bible equally encourages and equally offends. <clears throat> and so I just am asking you today, as you prepare yourself for the word of God, just go ahead and make a decision in your life. I'm not going to allow offense to block me from receiving revelation from God. <clears throat> Jesus says, blessed are those who are not offended because of me. The Bible says offense is a stumbling block to the righteous. So just go ahead and make a decision today. I'm not going to be offended. I'm going to have ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit of God would desire to speak in and through my life today. Genesis 39, starting in verse 1, this is what the Bible says. Watch, the Bible says this. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Now the Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Watch, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Let me just stop there for a moment this morning, friend. Prosperity happens in your soul before it happens in any other area of your life. Because when the soul prospers, it creates a healthy container to hold every other blessing. See, without a healthy soul, the abundance of God will turn you into an unfaithful steward who chases the wrong things in an attempt to fill the empty spaces of your heart. Hear me. God is a good father, won't answer the prayer for more until he is confident that his increase will help you instead of hurting you. See, this church has grown 4X in the last 12 months, but it took seven years of heart surgery until I could handle the increase. 
Now I know this increase isn't to my credit, it's to his. God had to bring me to a place of honoring him without the crowds before he could ever trust me with the crowds. And that's why the apostle John says this in 3 John 1, he says, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health even as your soul prospers. Watch. Who cares if your finances prosper if your soul dies? Who cares if your business prospers if your family fails? Who cares if your church grows if your integrity collapses? For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? See, when the soul prospers, the life soon follows. But we live in a nation so steeped in materialism and consumerism that we celebrate when the outside looks good even if the inside is toxic and dying. Oh friend, it don't matter how good the chest looks if the lungs are filled with cancer. Friend, if you will guard your heart, God will take care of your influence. If you will protect your soul, God will take care of your resources. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. I love when preachers only quote half of a promise without the condition. All of these things will be added unto you. No, it's if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Because when God finds a man or a woman who will seek him first, that's a person that he can trust with the abundance of heaven. See, in our culture today, we got a lot of Christians who want to seek the kingdom as an addendum to their already complicated lives. But God is looking for those who will seek the king and his kingdom first and foremost above every other thing. Hear me, hear me. Joseph was sold into slavery by jealous brothers. Because when his brothers couldn't kill the dream, the only option they had left was to try and kill the dreamer. Jealousy turns you into a monster. It makes you feel as if you've got to be the most important person in the room. It is tiring for your soul. It is bad for your health. It is toxic for your emotions. And what I found is jealousy is almost always the result of a lack of trust. I don't trust God that I will ever get mine. So I have to live in perpetual jealousy and competition when other people get theirs. See, jealousy makes you desire what your character is not yet ready to handle. And that's why we must learn the art of celebrating other people's success and trusting God with the timeline for our blessing. Honor is the opposite of jealousy. If you will honor what God has placed in somebody else's life, God will position you to receive out of the anointing and gifting that he's placed on somebody else. Here is the absolute beauty of Joseph's life. After he was sold into slavery, it would be 22 years before Joseph would ever see his family again. But by the time he is finally reintroduced to his brothers, after two decades of separation, he had been so healed up from the trauma of his past that he could say with full confidence, what you intended for evil, God has used for my good, so welcome home. See, some of you have been abandoned by family ridiculed by friends, mocked by associates. But you gotta begin to recognize that this isn't personal, it's spiritual. They don't hate you, they're just agitated by the destiny God has placed on your life. So let me give you permission this morning, let the dead bury their own. Your responsibility is to follow Christ. Now watch what verse three says, here's where it gets good. When Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. See friend, the success of Joseph was by virtue of the Lord being with him. It reminds me of what David says in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. See, Joseph's master was a 
pagan Egyptian ruler with literally zero concept of who Yahweh was. But even Potiphar could tell the Lord was with Joseph and it is what set him apart. Friend, people around you might not even know his name, but I promise you they can recognize the favor that is on your life. And when you operate as an ambassador from heaven to earth, you will find yourself surrounded by pagan folks who say things like this all the time. There's something different about you. You got a joy that's contagious. Every time you walk in the room, I feel peace. I don't know if it's an energy. I don't know if it's a vibe. I don't know if it's a frequency. And you'll be well positioned to say, let me tell you about the hope of glory. His name is Jesus. And he is the one who keeps me in perfect peace. It reminds me of what the folks in the early church said about the disciples. They said these was unlearned men, but they knew they had been with Jesus. Friends, success is the result of a life lived with the Lord. Some Christians want success from God without nearness to God, but God is not a vending machine. He is the Father and His delight is on you. And if we could only learn the art of being with Him, I promise your life will prosper in ways you could never imagine. Now watch what happens, verse five. From the time that Potiphar put Joseph in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian. Because of who? Because of Joseph. See, the blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. Watch, this is good. The blessing was on Potiphar because the blessing resided within Joseph. See, when you are a blessed person, you carry that blessing into every realm that you walk in. See, that's why it's not good enough for you just to get filled up. You're filled up for you, but you overflow for others. And that's why Paul says in Romans 15, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, friend, you've got something the world can't take because the world didn't give it. And when you find a deserving atmosphere, let what you carry rest upon it. And friend, if it isn't received, dust off your feet and keep going. Part of your development is facing rejection from people who cannot honor what you carry. But mature believers develop the tenacity to dust off their feet and keep walking on their journey. I am convinced that Joseph was a blessed seed in Potiphar's soil that caused everything around him to come to life. Hear me, I am convinced that you are a blessed seed planted in the soil of the Northwest. I get it, there's a lot of easier places to be. There's a lot of cities that have more sun than just one time a year. There are a lot of places where the political climate might be a little easier, but what if you began to reimagine your life through the lens of not just what do I receive, but what am I here to give? No, I am a blessed, redemptive seed planted in the soil of the Northwest and just watch what God will do through the canopy and influence of my life. See, Potiphar came under the canopy of Joseph's influence. Joseph wasn't the master of the house. Potiphar was the master of the house. But what Potiphar didn't recognize is that Yahweh is the master of the universe. And even though Joseph didn't have the top position, he was a blessed seed in the soil. See, some of us are waiting to have positional influence prior to God using us to be a blessing in somebody else's life. Well, I can't pray for them because I'm not a pastor. Well, I can't invite them because my life doesn't have it together yet. I'm just waiting for another title, another degree, another training, another master class before I finally feel like God can use me. But what if... God could speak to you by his spirit today and say right where you're at, right with what you're dealing with, right with the talents and the giftings that I have given you, you can be a seed that can turn an entire household to the glory of God. What if you begin to reimagine your life through that context this morning? No, I'm a blessed seed. I haven't been buried, I've been planted. And one man plants and another man waters 
but my God brings increase. Friend, that's who you are. Watch in verse six. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now watch, Joseph was well-built and handsome. I was preaching at a young adult conference once and praying for a young man at the altar and I just happened to ask him, man, what's your life verse? He told me, pastor, it's Genesis 39.6. Now I didn't know what Genesis 39.6 said. I just said, man, that's so awesome. Just want to encourage you. So great that God has given you a life verse. Man, just really steward that. Go after that. Get a tattoo of that. Just, man, go for it. I got home that night. I started thinking, I never heard of Genesis 39.6. I looked it up. I said, this weasel, he got me. <laughs> now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. Yep. Watch what happens. Every strength in your life is a former weakness that God has developed for his glory. Every weakness in your life is a yet to be developed strength that God is waiting for your permission to grow. See, Joseph was well built and handsome, but he didn't come out of the womb well built and handsome. He came out of the womb looking like every other baby looks when they come out of the womb. And can I just be honest? We're going to go ahead and stop pretending that when babies come out of the womb, they look nice, because they don't. <laughs> Sometimes you have a kid, you say, that one needs to be cooked a little longer. Put him back. He ain't done. <laughs> the Bible says Joseph was well-built and handsome. See, this was a developed trait. It was a developed discipline. But hear me, it also became the focal point for an attack from the enemy. Just because it's developed doesn't mean it isn't susceptible. See, the enemy loves to attack us in areas that we think are impenetrable. Oh, I'll never struggle with lust. Oh, I could never struggle with jealousy. Oh, I could never struggle with pride. Oh, I could never struggle with lying. Oh, I could never struggle with dishonor. Friends, you already are. Watch what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Sometimes we become like the Pharisees, thanking God that we don't sin like those other folks in church. Now watch. After a while, verse 7, the master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. They wasn't watching Sunday morning cartoons. They wasn't in bed to do a devotional together. She said, come to bed with me. But he refused. He said, with me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in this house. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You've got to see it. You've got to see it, friend. Joseph identified sexual sin as a wicked thing done against God. It wasn't just a mistake that could hurt his career. It wasn't just a setback that could cause him embarrassment. Joseph identified this invitation into sexual sin as an act of rebellion against a holy God. The angels in Revelation, they surround the throne and they don't cry out grace, grace, grace. They cry out holy, holy, holy. And it's not because Jesus isn't filled with grace. It's because his holiness is an invitation into his grace for our God is holy. And I think sometimes in life, in the way that we approach scripture, Jesus is either filled with truth or he's filled with grace. But my Bible says he's filled with both. Oh, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Oh, if you think grace is cheap, figure out how low mercy goes for. God is always giving us out of the abundance of his riches and glory. But Paul says, should we sin even more and in doing so abuse the free gift of grace that he's given us? And Paul gives a two-word answer, certainly not. I love how Joseph identified this, not just as a setback to his career, not just an embarrassing moment that he would have to go on Instagram to explain, 
He identified this as a wicked thing against God. Now, if I'm Joseph, to be honest, I don't have a lot of respect for Yahweh at this point. You gave me a dream, and all it did was get me sold into slavery. All it did was wind me up in this hellhole called Egypt. All it did was make my life go in the wrong direction. But I think the reason why the Lord prospered Joseph wherever he went is because what he cared, carried in his heart was a fear and reverence for the one true God. And his heart was still sensitive enough in this moment to say, you can have my coat, you can have my shoes, you can have my tunic, but you can't have my integrity. I am not for sale. I belong to God. There was a story of a man who was eating at a restaurant and saw a well-dressed woman from across the restaurant and sent her a message through one of the waiters and he said, if I were to offer you a million dollars, would you sleep with me tonight? And the woman responded shortly after, yes, I would. And about 10 minutes later, when the second course was being served, this man called the waiter over and sent another message to the woman across the restaurant. He said, would you sleep with me for half a million dollars? And the response was a little slower this time, but it was still a yes, I would. And finally, near the end of his dessert, he called the waiter over one more time and sent a message to the woman across the restaurant. And he said, would you, would you come home with me tonight just for a dollar? The lady was so offended, she stood up and shouted at him. What do you think I am? And the man responded, I already know what you are. I'm just trying to figure out how much it's going to cost. We are not for sale. Your integrity is not for sale. Your worship and devotion is not for sale. Friend, we have given up the right to self-identify as anything less than a child of God because our lives are not our own. They have been bought with a price. No, we are not for sale to the highest bidder in the Northwest. In fact, Paul addresses sexual brokenness and sin in almost every single one of his letters to the early churches. Sexual immorality in the Greek is the word pornea. It's where we get the English word pornography. It's used 25 times in the New Testament alone. As the biblical authors consistently warn against the destruction of pornea. Watch 1 Corinthians 6.13. The body is not meant for pornea, but for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6 and 18. Flee from pornea. Ephesians 5 and 3, but among you there must not even be a hint of pornea. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid pornea. Why does God care about who you marry? Why does the God of the universe care about who you have sex with or the nature of your relationships? Watch, he cares because he is the original designer and authoritative creator and he alone has the right to dictate what is true about the human experience. Friend, we are image bearers. We are not image makers. When you give your life to Christ, you give up your right to make yourself in your own image. You give up your right to define what is true and what is good. No, our definitions don't belong to popular culture. They belong to God. Our world says if it feels good, do it. The Bible says do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Our world says love is love. The Bible says do not love the world or anything in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Our world says gender is fluid. The Bible says he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. Our world says I got to try it before I buy it. The Bible says marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled. Hear me friend, biblical illiteracy creates a vacuum in which sexual sin thrives. We must know what the Bible says. 
We must know what the gospels declare. We must know how the spirit speaks or else our lives will be governed by every passing heresy of the fractured world around us. Can I be honest this morning? Both homosexual sin and heterosexual sin will lead you to the same exact place of bondage. Why is God so utterly adamant about protecting the context in which his creation can experience sexuality? Dr. Ashley says it this way, because marriage and intimacy is a reflection of the gospel. Marriage is a portrait painted upon the canvas of creation to display the glory of God. Anything which perverts the portrait of marriage consequently distorts the picture of worship which it was created to display. Hear me, when we do violence to marriage, we do violence to the gospel. When we do violence to sexuality, we do violence to the gospel. When we do violence to gender, we do violence to the gospel. Friend, these are not social constructs, they are scriptural commands. Our incompetent political leaders love the idea that June is Pride Month. They can't manage to do anything about gas prices, but they sure love to let us know how woke the armed forces have become. Corporations fall all over themselves to change logos to rainbows to make sure everyone knows how tolerant and accepting they are. Aristotle was right. Tolerance and apathy are the last virtues of a dying society. Hear me today. Pride is the pregnant mother of all sins. Notice, sexual immorality travels in a pack. It comes with idolatry, it comes with violence, it comes with brokenness, it comes with abuse, it comes with the dysfunction. When pride gives birth in your life, it breeds an entire line of dysfunctional offspring that wreak havoc on your spiritual destiny. Listen, we have to love people enough to tell them the truth. If you sleep with the culture, if you engage with compromise, if you refuse to live righteous, you run the risk of contracting STDs, spiritually transmitted diseases. Put on your seatbelt, I ain't even done. <laughs> Sexual sin will leave you with a broken heart. Sexual sin will leave you with a fractured image of God. Sexual sin will leave you with an insecure view of self. But here's the good news. Only a God as good as the one we read about in this book has the power to make you new no matter how many mistakes you have made. And here's the reality, friend. You don't get to choose your temptation, but you can choose your response. Can I be honest this morning? Everybody in this room is guilty of sexual sin. You know how I know that? For Jesus says to even look upon a person with lust is to commit adultery in your heart. No, I'm not mad at people who sin differently than me, but today I'm gonna challenge you. Come out of dysfunction and enter in to holiness. If you were to continue to read the story, you would see that after Joseph refuses the advances of Potiphar's wife, she gets so aggress aggressive that she grabs his coat. He leaves it in her hand and runs out of the house. But it wasn't enough. Potiphar's wife was so embarrassed that she got turned down by Joseph that she concocted an entire lie, story, that it was actually Joseph the one who was trying to make an advance on her. Here's what I found. When you won't give the culture what it wants, it will accuse you of what it is guilty of. See, I find it interesting that the most intolerant people I've ever met preach the loudest message about tolerance. Really? People don't wanna hear your opinion? They want to hear their opinion come out of your mouth. Oh, it's fine that you're a Christian, but as soon as you won't bow to my flag, 
capitulate to my identity or affirm my sexuality, then I'm gonna label you as a bigot and a hater. But I'll tell you this, I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. We will not bow to the religion of secularism in the West. I will not cower to the rainbow alphabet mafia. The church of Jesus Christ must, with bright and bold contrast, be unapologetic about not fitting in. Become okay with being called every name in the book. We are not living for the affirmation of Babylon. We are living for well done, good and faithful servants. Here's what we need. Come on, go ahead and stay standing. I'm about to close. Listen, we need an unconditional love for people and an unwavering allegiance to scripture. And I believe that we can do both. You don't have to choose scripture and then be a jerk to people who sin differently than you. You also don't have to choose love and then pretend that the Bible doesn't say what it actually says. No, I wanna love people like Jesus did. Guess what, if you struggle with sexual sin, you got a seat in my church. You struggle with your identity, come sit at my table. You got something that happened in your life that you're ashamed of, you can go ahead and st stand under my canopy because you are not what you've done. You are not what people have done to you. You are not the sum total of your abuse or your mistakes. You are everything that Jesus says you are. And I'm gonna love you right where you're at. And I'm gonna accept you right where you're at. And I'm gonna honor you right where you're at. But I'm gonna preach an allegiance to the high ethic of scripture and encourage you to enter into a sanctification process by which you are made new day after day after day. No, the pursuit is still a perfect place for imperfect people. You're struggling today? Keep on moving forward. You feel embarrassed today? Shake off that shame and condemnation. You made a mistake yesterday? His mercy is new every morning. You feel like you're fighting demons let me add my faith to yours because you're gonna have victory in your life I'm not gonna quit until the unconditional love of God is felt in the world and an allegiance to scripture is preached in the pulpits of our churches that is who we are that is who we are come on let me pray for you father now in the mighty name of Jesus I thank you for my friends all across this room that we are all sinners who have been saved by grace, not of good works so that no man could boast. That when you hung on the cross, you paid the debt for every sin that I could ever even conceive. God, I pray today that this would be a line in the sand moment for many in this room who would cross over out of dysfunction into function, out of disobedience into obedience, out of lackluster living into righteous walking by faith. God, today we submit our members to you. Every part of who we are, mind, body, heart, soul, strength. God, we submit it to you as our reasonable service. And God, I pray that you would fill us with faith and courage. That you would give us the ability to get back up, walk in the way that we should go, that we would never depart from it. And God, we're going to be quick to return all glory and praise to you. In the powerful name of Jesus. Come on, all God's people said amen and amen. Friend, if you're here today and you'd like prayer before you leave, man, I should love to add my faith to yours to see God do a miracle in your life. If not, God bless. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for church. We're gonna be back here next week, all five services. Hey, would you invite a friend? Come on, let's help build the house of God together. We'll see you real soon.